Thank God we are alive today and we can come into God's presence uh, knowing that we, he has been good to us. And uh, as usual, I say that I understand just because you're able to listen does not mean all is well with you. But joy will come in the morning. And so we are happy to welcome you uh, for this broadcast today, hoping that by God's grace as you listen, you would experience his presence in your life. You don't have to feel him. You don't have to, 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 to touch him. All you need, my friend, is to be able to know that he is with you, for that is his promise. And so today, as we welcome you, no matter where you are, we pray that God would reach out and touch you today and that your souls would be made well. Would you pray with me at this time? Father and our God, we are so happy and thankful to know that you are God. You could have been anything. You could have been a rude landlord. You, you could have been arbitrary. You could have been just anything you wanted to be. But seeing that you are a God who refers to himself as our Father, we are so thankful to know that we have a loving Heavenly Father. Come into our hearts today. Forgive us for sin. Empty us of everything that is unlike you. Fill us with your spirit. And help, O oh Lord, as your word is spoken, that we would see you better, understand what you want us to do, and that we would be able by your grace to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, for we pray it in his precious name. Amen. Again, friend, I want to remind you that we are going through a course that we started the week before, um, the popularity gospel. Again, uh, my friend, I, I just want to remind you that unfortunately, the gospel is not as popular as you think. Even today, in the United States of America, a country that, oh, maybe about 35, 40 years ago, up to 85% of the people thought or would consider themselves Christians. Today that has slid down to about 73. Maybe it's even less now. All because we want to do what we want. And God, if you want to be our God, you'll have to bend to our wishes and desires. Oh, my friend, our world has gotten to a place where it needs to turn around, do a 180 uh, degree, and get to know who God is so that our souls might be saved. You know, when Jesus came to earth, my friend, he didn't come here because he wanted simply to show the power of God, which was one thing that was obvious, but Jesus came so that we might be saved. In the eons of time, and we say time, God is, not, God is not boxed in by time. God is eternal. From eternity to eternity. Now, none of us know what infinitude is. We, 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 we don't even bother to try counting it. That's what God is. In God, he foresaw. Can you imagine that God could foresee what earth would become as he created earth, put in all those beautiful trees and shaped the mountains and hang the stars in place and all those animals? And then he said, there's one thing lacking. I want something on earth that looks like me. And so he formed 
He took clay and formed it, breathed into it, and the Bible says a man became a living soul. And then, friend, of course, he put Adam back to sleep and took a rib out of his side, put it into Eve. Adam called her woman. And they too, the Bible says, became one flesh. And so, my friend, I want us to understand today What's important is not what we want or what others want, what the world is clamoring for, what even the popularity gospel teaches in their churches. What's important today is the word of God. We need to settle on the word of God. Some say, if it's from the Bible, it's good for me. If it's not from the Bible, I throw it away. And so today I'm proud to know by God's grace that I can speak to you in the name of Jesus and let you know what his word in the Bible teaches us today. It has taught many in past centuries, continues to teach today, and I pray that by God's grace, we all would come to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul says, For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved. Yours may be of a different religion. Yours may be of some other denomination. Yours may be of some other cult. I don't know what it is that you believe. But until you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus, my friend, as Jesus said to that Samaritan woman by the well, you do not know what you believe. And so today, I want to take a different aspect of uh, what we taught of or about last week from Matthew and let Mark give his uh, version of it. And uh, many believe that Mark's version of the gospel primarily came from the Apostle Peter. And so we're going to read from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. Kind of the same language, but just simply wanting to reiterate, not because we don't have many other uh, passages of Scripture to, to look at, we will, but wanting to reiterate, emphasize what Jesus has to say to you and me today. So here goes. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now, when you come from Jerusalem, supposedly, you've come from the top of the mountain, Mount Zion. Uh, there's no other place as holy as Mount Zion or Jerusalem. By the way, that's where Abraham went to offer Isaac. When, when he sought to offer Isaac, God commanded him to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Yes, that's, what, that's where Abraham went. And so, it's a very important place, a holy place. And so when men of learning, of understanding, of the religious leaders came from Jerusalem, you bowed the knee. Verse 2 says, Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Now, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, our world today, we can find fault with many things, even faultless things 
we find fault with them. You know, if you don't believe me, ask people who, when they fall into trouble, as much as they don't believe in God, when they find themselves in trouble, they blame God for what's going on in their lives. You know, one can remember someone like Job's wife. Uh, when Job was going through a hectic time in his life, in fact, the most hectic time in his life, having lost his children, lost his flocks, lost everything that he owned, the only thing that seemed to have been left to him was his life and his wife. And she sought to use the words of Satan, of Lucifer, of the devil, that old serpent, the dragon. And so if she's using his words, guess who is speaking to or through her? Satan had said to God, if you remove all these bounties from around Job, you know very well he'll curse you to the face. And so God said to him, go ahead. Do what you want, but don't touch him at first. But then eventually, when Job had lost everything and God had allowed Job, the, the enemy to touch Job's skin or flesh, of course, you know all the boils and, 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 and diseases that seemed to have crawled up to the point where Job had to take something and just scrape from the top of his skull down to the sole of his feet. Poor guy couldn't bear it. The pain was unbearable. And the wife looked at him and she said, you still want to maintain your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? And Job, to his credit, could instinctly hear the voice of the enemy, much like Jesus heard the voice of the enemy through, through Peter. When he had to say to Peter, he wasn't talking directly to Peter, but Peter thought that he was. When he said to Peter, get thee hence, Satan. Sometimes the enemy of our souls can use people to speak for him. So we have to be careful. When you hear somebody speak, be careful that you know that they are actually speaking for God. The Bible says that some speak who has not, who has not been spoken to. Some run who were not sent. Sometimes people speak in the name of Jesus when Jesus has not sent them anywhere. They claim to be a messenger of God, to be an evangelist, to be something that God has not appointed them to. And so, my friend, I just want you to understand and to know that we are only to listen, not to Pastor Francois, but the word of God. For that's what I present to you each and every time I stand before this camera. By the way, should have told you this earlier. Uh, my wife and I are uh, planning to uh, start a, a, a podcast and we'll be talking about life. I hope you guys will join us. Uh, we have not finalized the day yet. And we'll, we'll be doing it, hopefully, on a weekly basis. Um, and we, we would be inviting you to join with us, uh, to contribute, to, 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 to answer questions, and to uh, maybe you may have comments that you want to make. Uh, we would be delighted to hear from you. Um, but it should start soon, perhaps as soon as next week. But... Here it is. The 
the leaders coming from Jerusalem. Verse 3 says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. You don't just wash your hands. You know, during uh, the pandemic, we were told to, to wash our hands in a, in a special way, to, to, to have it uh, running water over us for a certain time, and to make sure that we, it, our hands were covered with soap and we were supposed to be careful as to how we washed it. Well, it seems back then the tradition was that you had to wash your hands in a certain way. Uh, given the impression to those who watch you that your hands were clean and undefiled. That was the tradition of the elders. And so, verse 4 says, When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. You know, you're out there, you get dirty and filthy. and oh, Ladies and gentlemen, as you will find out, Jesus didn't have a problem with washing. Never had a problem with washing. Of course you could wash your hands. Of course you could wash your feet. Of course you should take a shower. Of course you can take a bath. Of course you should clean yourself up. Of course you should be hygienic. But how closely is it linked to one's salvation, one's soul salvation. Well, they say, and there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Oh, everything was to be neat and clean. And again, friend, you know, when you're going to invite guests to your home in particular, of course, we do it with or without guests, but especially when guests are coming in. You ought to be sure uh, that perhaps some of the, the utensils that you use are some that have been hidden maybe for years or months. They're not commonly used. They are, they are cleaned and set apart. You want to make sure that they look good so that your guests would marvel at what you present to them. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that the tradition of the elders counted on. But what did that have to do with their soul salvation? As much as they clamored about clean things, clean hands, clean uh, uh, feet. What did that have to do with their salvation? Verse 5, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? What's wrong with you, Jesus? Why don't you follow protocol? Why don't you guys know that you need to wash up before you eat? Don't you know it's considered unclean that you put things in your mouth without first washing your hands? Come on now. You should know the tradition of the elders. It is the proper and right thing to do. In fact, it is salvific. Well, you know, Jesus knows how to talk, how to answer, how to point in the right direction. So verse 6 says, He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Going to church is a great thing to do. Paul says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. It's important that we gather together to worship God, to give him praise, to give him thanks. Look at all that he has done for you every morning so far through this week. In fact, all your life. He has kept breath in your nostrils. That didn't happen by accident. That didn't happen just because you made it so. You didn't happen to wake up this morning. God left breath in your nostril. He gave you strength in your muscles. He made your bones strong. He had blood flowing through your veins. Ladies and gentlemen, consequently, when we go to church, we ought to praise him, give him glory, because he deserves it. Worthy is the Lamb. He deserves our praise, our thanksgiving, our sacrifices. We don't deserve anything God gives, but look at what he has done. Look at what he has done, especially having given us his only begotten son. Whilst he spared Abraham, his son Isaac, God gave his only begotten son, who is full of grace and truth, just so that you and me could be delivered from the fiery flames of hell. And he has gone to prepare a place for you and me so that we may enjoy eternal life with him. And so Jesus is saying, never mind you hypocrites. It was said a long time ago by the prophet Isaiah, some 800 years before Jesus came, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You enter church, ladies and gentlemen. Don't make it a show. Because you play the guitar, and there's nothing wrong in enjoying the playing of the guitar, or beating the drums, or playing the piano, or the keyboard or the saxophone, or the violin, or some wind instrument. No, nothing wrong with that. Playing it and enjoying it, great stuff. But are you doing it for show, or are you doing it worshiping and praising the Lord? You see, my friend, when God created Adam and Eve, it was not simply to place them on earth so that they could eat fruits, grains, nuts, and, and, and other stuff. No. And by the way, when God created Adam and Eve, there was no such thing as pork chops or uh, ribs or, or uh, fried fish or anything like that. No. Or like some people like to eat sushi. Uh, I don't criticize those who eat sushi. I just can't take it. But the point being, God's purpose for placing us on earth, ladies and gentlemen, was to have a relationship with him. And as that relationship developed, we worshiped him. We thanked him. We appreciated what God was doing. Because, you see, he demonstrates his love day in, day out. Even when Cain slaughtered his brother Abel, God could have just sent him out there and be killed. But when he complained, God said, no, I'm going to set a mark on you so that those who see you will know who you are and go away from you. They won't kill you. What mercy. What grace. And so, friend, 
when we enter into the courts of worship, not only bow the knee, but your heart. It's a thing between you and God. Not so much between you and those around you. By the way, it's important that those around you see what you do and say because they are observing you. You know, very often people say they don't care about the relationship with other church members just as long as they have a relationship with God. The Bible asks, how can you have a relationship with God and not with your brother and sister? You can see them, you can have a relationship with them, but you want one with God. It doesn't work that way, ladies and gentlemen. Those people that you despise, you look down at, or you just simply don't care about, they are the children of God. Sometimes because we belong to a certain church, denomination, or religion, we, we despise or look down at others. Ladies and gentlemen, they all came from the hand of the Creator. From one person. All things, John said, was made by him. And there's nothing that was made that wasn't made by him. Jesus. And so, he's the one who did everything. He's the one who made us all. And therefore, when we go down on our knees, let our hearts be bowed as well. You know, there's a special passage of scripture you may have heard me quote before, found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and depart from their wicked ways, then, oh, God is good, my friend. God is a good God. And so, as we seek to worship, don't do it because somebody expects you to do that. Don't do it because you think other people are looking at you. Do it from a humble heart. Do it from a heart of love. Do it from a heart that feels obligated to worship God. Not an obligation that is forced, but one that delights in giving praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus continues in verse 7. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, my friend, we can't have it both ways. We cannot have it both ways. We cannot obey God and at the same time follow men. It doesn't work that way. It cannot work that way. It's got to be God and God alone. He's the only one who deserves our praise and our worship. He's the only one worthy. You know, when John on the Isle of Patmos, on that Sunday morning, John was lifted up in the spirit of prophecy. And he said that he saw many things. One of those things that he saw was Jesus. But he was covered in such a way. His eyes was like a flaming fire. Jesus said to, to John, John, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I am he who was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore and have the keys of hell and of death. Hell not being the fiery furnace, but the grave. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus wants to remind us of who he is. 
what he can do. And so, as John continued to look, John said he saw many beings, the 24 elders around the throne of God, and some other beings around that had eyes all around their head. And they cast their crowns before the throne, shouting, Holy, holy, holy. And then there were books open in heaven, he said. And as those books were being opened, there was one final book. It seemed no one could open it. And they searched all over heaven. No one could open the book, and so John started to cry. And there was a hand on his shoulder. A mighty angel touched him and said, don't worry. There's one who is worthy to open the book. <laughs> that lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, he is worthy to open the book of life. And that's where our names ought to be written. Our names ought to be written in the Lamb's book of life so that as we worship him, we do not worship in vain, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. No, instead, teach the commandments of God. Thus saith the Lord. You know, sometimes during his 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, toward the end, the enemy came and said, if you be the son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? And Jesus would remind him, it is written. It is written. It's not as if the devil didn't know, but Jesus seemed to have to remind him. It's not what you think or what is popular. You want to see a miracle? No. What's important is what is written in the word of God. And so Jesus is saying there, ladies and gentlemen, they're teaching for doctrines the commandments of God of men. Verse 8 says, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. Now, ladies and gentlemen, how can we prosper as Christians? As those who seek to know God, how can we prosper when we lay aside the commandments of God? The commandments of God is what gives us guidance into getting to know God. It's like today, for example, lots of people do long distance uh, relationships. You know, uh, they haven't met each other, but they try to describe each other for the other back then in my day. Uh, we had pen pals, uh, we wrote letters. Uh, the letter is supposed to, 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 to describe affectionately who I am, what I would expect from the other person, what I think I can give. God's commandments teaches us what God expects of us. And as we walk towards what God says, ladies and gentlemen, he says we are blessed because he knows what's best for us. As much as we think we are intelligent and wise, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says the wisdom of men is foolishness to God. We don't know. We know very little. Eight months ago it is said that, uh, is it Webster? 
a space shuttle, or maybe not a shuttle, but satellite. Discovered another eight galaxies. And they are wondering how come the lights are not as blue as the others, but are kind of red, seeming to indicate that they are dying, or maybe were born a long time ago after they maybe they they were the first in in the Big Bang. Shut up. You don't know anything about a Big Bang. Ladies and gentlemen, Big Bang theorists and evolutionists are just that. They are believers in something that cannot prove. They are believers. They can't prove a Big Bang. They talk about it and they want us to accept it as gospel. It's not gospel. It's not true. I believe in the word of God. And it is proven that the Bible is the most extant writings in history. You cannot find anything earlier than the word of God. You know why? Because that's how everything began. So, how come we can lay aside the commandment of God? We cannot, ladies and gentlemen. It's our guide. It's our schoolmaster. You hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. Those are traditions. Those are things you choose to do. He said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Told you last week, someone said, this particular church has more authority over the Bible. The church has authority over the Bible. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you hear a church saying that, shouldn't you run? Shouldn't you find a place where you can hide or go looking for the truth? You know, one of these days, many will be running to and fro searching for the truth will seek to pay millions to get the truth. That truth that I'm preaching today, people will want to hear it, want to know about it, but perhaps too late. The Bible says today that you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Let God come in, my friend. Don't set aside God's commandments. And instead, keep your traditions. Don't do things that you think is proper. You know? Oh, we, we, we have lavish uh, uh, parties because somebody sprinkled the head of a baby and said you were baptized. My friend, the Bible doesn't speak about sprinkling of a baby. By the way, before one is baptized, one needs to acknowledge sin. And then we need to repent of our sins. And to repent of our sins, we need to be turned into a savior. And then, as we repent, we seek baptism. Can the baby do that? Does the baby know right from wrong at the time of birth? Okay, forget birth. Maybe anywhere between three to six months. Does the baby know anything about that? No, friend. 
can't baptize a baby. Baby doesn't know any different between right and wrong. Of course, because of this, this, this evil gene in us, we grow up doing wrong even unknowingly. But as we grow up, our parents, our teachers, society teaches us right from wrong. Although today, my friend, society is becoming so corrupt. We don't know anymore, society says, who is a male and who is a female. Therefore, if somebody, a male says he's female, we should let him into a female's uh, bathroom. Mister, my wife goes into the bathroom, and I know you're a male calling yourself a female. I'll get in there and drag you out. My wife needs privacy. I was watching a race, an uh, athletic race, uh, don't know if it was 400 meters, but a so-called transgender, a guy who says he was a female, was run, running with the women, and he ended up way ahead of him, of them. I, will, I almost want to say a quarter mile, but that might be an exaggeration. Why? Men are typically faster than women. Not all, but typically men are faster than women. And you want to participate as a man in women's uh, track and field? That's not fair. Mister, today as I fill out my, my, my doctor's appointment, <clears throat> they ask, male or female? What were you born as? What do you consider yourself as? That is so unfair. So out of the way. Society has become corrupt. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm being told that I'm supposed I'm supposed to respect that. Well, you know what? I, I respect the individual, but not their behavior. I love every individual, but please don't ask me to accept your lifestyle. I don't. I don't. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot go along with man's teaching and at the same time carry the word of God with us. It does not work. We've got to drop one. Just like God says, Peter, Thomas, Elaine, whatever your name is out there, I offer you today life or death. Choose. But I counsel you to choose life and live. God will not force you. God will not force a transgender to become what he doesn't want to become. But just know that God made us male and female. He didn't make you both. And so today I want you to understand that Jesus is saying all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Your tradition, my friend, will not take you to heaven. Now you ask, are you saying that there are things I can do to go to heaven? My friend, people like to get into arguments, useless arguments. You know, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, 
not of works, lest any man should boast. There's nothing we can do in order to be able to go to heaven except as we accept the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Today, my friend, I want to end by quoting verse 10. Jesus says, For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. Well, Ephesians 6 says, Honor thy father and mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which God has given you. Honoring your parents, my friend, is a great gift. Some people feel like once they've made it, their parents should have been able to take care of themselves. Never mind that your parents gave up so much for you to make you who you are today. My friend, you're not doing your parents a favor by giving them anything. Today, even today, I'm an adult. I feel independent. But I feel like I owe my mom everything. Now somebody out there says, well, you may feel that way, but I don't. You should. Because of what she has done for you. Because of what your dad has done for you. Jesus wants us to choose between God and tradition. What are you going to do? God wants you to come to him. Are you going to come? Or are you going to walk out like the rich young ruler who wanted to know what he could do to enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. Eventually, when he had t told Jesus that he had kept the commandments from a young age, Jesus said, well, go. Sell all of what you have and give the proceeds to the poor and then come, follow me. See, my friend, what God requires of us for some is too much. We rather go the way of the world. Well, my friend, it's a choice that you have to make. The straight and narrow or the wide road that leads to hell. I encourage you today. Take Jesus as your own. Obey the voice of God. Obey his command, not the traditions of men, the church, or religious leaders. Know what the word of God says. And if you are in doubt... Call up somebody. Call me up. And we'll talk about it. Not because, friend, I simply want to hear your voice, which I'd love to. But I know by the grace of God, I'll be telling you the truth, pointing you to the word of God. So, if you want to join me as we walk with Jesus today, I invite you to bow your heads where you are. And let us talk to him. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you recognizing that we have gone the wrong way in times past. But we are willing to walk with you. Forgive us for our past mistakes. But, oh Lord, we can't do it on our own. We need you. Hold our hand and lead us into life eternal so that when your kingdom comes, we can go home with you. For we pray it all in the worthy and precious name of Jesus, and for his sake, and the church around the world said, Amen. May God richly bless you as we continue to study his word 
and that you, friend, open your heart's door to him. Until next week, blessings on all of you. Bye-bye.